Excellent. So I think that's a, probably a 10 o'clock bells that I've just heard here where we are. And um, I know we'll have lots of people joining us as we uh, we start this first bit. But um, I'd just like to say good morning. My name is Joe Swift. Uh, and on behalf of the Environment Agency, I'd like to welcome you to our Clean Air Day webinars on air quality, inequalities and inequities. Um, we've got a packed agenda where, with lots of important issues to discuss. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand you over and introduce you to our chair for the first session, which is Joanna Lane from uh, Natural Resources Wales. So Joanna, over to you and good luck. Thanks, Joe. Uh, happy Clean Air Day to everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I'm speaking to you from Cardiff. I work for Natural Resources Wales. And for anyone who hasn't come across us before, um, we're responsible in Wales for uh, lots of environmental regulation, uh, for example, working with industry to make sure that we're monitoring air quality in Wales, uh, that we're modelling the potential impacts and that we're working with those industrial uh, and agricultural sites to move towards cleaner technology and methods. Um, but the reason I'm here today really is because we also recognise in Natural Resources Wales that our obligations are wider than that. Um, we need to think about current and future generations um, and the kind of impacts that air quality is having on their lives. So um, I'm sure you're all aware, but just as a very brief introduction to the session today, at a population level, we know that air pollution represents the largest environmental risk to public health in the UK. Um, it can lead to short term and long term health issues, but it impacts on some groups more than other. And that's why we're here today to talk about equity. Um, before I introduce the first speaker, uh, I'd just like to do um, a little bit of housekeeping. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, I'm just going to run through kind of conduct. So we're in webinar mode. Um, hopefully people have got a bit used to using Zoom this year, but webinar mode is a little bit different. So if you want to submit questions for any of the speakers or the panel, please use the Q&A function. Um, you're also very welcome to use the chat function um, to provide comments. Um, and really what we'd like you to do today is introduce yourself in the chat box and, and absolutely post links to any work that you're doing, campaigns, articles that you're involved with. Um, the great thing about the project we're going to hear about today uh, is really that we're building a network around some of these issues. So we want you to be part of that. Um, we will use the email addresses on the Zoom attendee list to distribute the slides that we use today for the presentations, uh, notes, and a link to the recording. If you want to opt out of any of that, uh, please contact Joe Swift or Julian Watkins, who you can see on the call, and you can message them directly. Um, as I say, we will be recording the session um, and sharing it. If I could just flick back very briefly to the previous slide, um, this is what we're going to be running through in the next hour. We've got loads to cover um, and we're not going to spend too much time introducing people because you can find all of these people online. Their research and their work is um, really well shared. So if you want to find out more about any of them, I'd really recommend looking them up. I think we're also going to share some links to their work in the chat today. Right. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our keynote speaker today, which is Professor, Professor John Fairburn. Um, and he's going to really set the scene for why equity is so important to the discussions on Clean Air Day today. John, can I hand over to you? Thanks. Thanks very much, John. Right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, great that we've got this annual event again, which does really raise the profile um, well uh, within the country. Um, some of us were on a meeting just before with the, uh, the parliamentary group listening there, and there's events on all day, um, particularly with a focus on schools this year. I've been looking at the Twitter feed. There's loads on schools going on, which is great. Next slide, please. So there's, there's really um, big changes coming on air quality policy um, very soon, really, or, or, or already starting. Firstly, um, in the USA, which I'm going to talk about very briefly, um, the European Union, both of these are being informed by the work of the World Health Organization. Um, there, there was a tweet out yesterday saying that there may be some delay. Originally, 
the World Health Organization was supposed to publish in July the new air quality standards. Looks like it might be delayed to the autumn now. <clears throat> and one of the things I'm concerned about is, is what is going to happen in the UK? What are we actually going to do um, with uh, air quality policy? Next slide, please. So um, it all change under President Biden, at least in terms of policy wise. This was one of his uh, earliest um, presidential actions. Um, and you can see here that where the federal government has failed to meet that commitment in the past, it must advance environmental justice. Um, and you'll have this presentation, um, you've got the links, but the <coughs> Environmental Protection Agency, the equivalent of the Environment Agency um, in the UK has now made, uh, has now been told or is incorporating environmental justice into all of their plans. Um, and that comes from, I suppose, in part a legacy of the civil rights movement where environmental justice started uh, in America. But that's coming in now. Next slide, please. This is a very important uh, appointment. This is, they call them administrators in America, but basically it means the chief, the chief of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, he is an air quality specialist, um, also the first black person ever to hold this post. But it's not just him. As well as that, Biden has proposed a new position of environmental justice administrator at the equivalent of the uh, Environment Agency and put in a budget which includes 212 environmental justice posts uh, in America. So that would go with the Office of Environmental Protection they have there. So change uh, at least uh, happening at policy level. We've got to see what they're going to do. Um, but the, the mood music is completely different from when Trump was there. Um, you know, completely uh, turn around. Next slide, please. Um, these are the uh, 2030 targets um, that have come out for um, the European Union uh, just very recently. Um, and the, the top one, most of these link to what we're talking about anyway, but the top one is particularly important. So they want by 2030 a 55% reduction in the health impacts of air pollution. Um, but also linked to that, obviously noise is often linked to air pollution. So they're talking about a 30 reduction in transport noise, a 25% in uh, ecosystems threatened by air pollution as well. Um, so quite significant or very significant, we say, because that 2030 isn't a long way away. Next slide, please. Um, here is the timeline in particular with some of the biggest policy um, uh, measures that are going to happen over the next couple of years at the EU level. Um, obviously, we're not in the EU and I'm going to come back to that, but um, really quite big, important stuff uh, here. Um, a, a number of really international meetings and also uh, air quality reports coming out on an annual basis as well. Next slide, please. Um, and this is, uh, this is the focus for the EU directive um, that they want to uh, improve. The first one, uh, particularly important, I think they realized that in the past, the EU did not align strongly enough with the World Health Organization. They did for some of the standards, but not all of them. Um, but certainly the mood music now currently is far stronger um, about aligning with what comes out of the World Health Organization. The last standards were 2005. In that 15 years or so, we have had an absolute mountain of evidence about the damage that poor air quality does to all parts of the body and to and the link to so many different diseases that we didn't really know before. Um, so I think that will be a, a really massive improvement if they adopt those standards because they will be challenging standards, um, particularly to meet them in urban areas. Um, second policy area there is improving the legislative framework. Um, currently, there's about 17 countries in the EU that have got a measure against them for failing to meet air quality. And there was a big conference a couple of weeks ago where they had the top people from the EU saying, yes, they do need to push harder on that, about holding the countries to account who have failed to meet those air quality standards. 
And then the third one is really a, a technical measure, really, which is the strengthening of monitoring and modeling plans. Um, so, so you can see here a, a huge amount coming from the EU, very strongly influenced by the World Health Organization and the work they do. Big changes looking possible in America. Next slide, please. So what's going to happen in uh, England and Wales? And I'm focusing on England and Wales, not Scotland uh, and, and Ireland, because uh, they've got uh, they've obviously devolved situation. Um, but in England and Wales, um, this this first message from the Environment Secretary, the Office for Environment Protection will be a world leader in environmental regulation. That is a very similar message that was put out during the Brexit campaign. Michael Gove uh, was one of the people who repeatedly said, we will have better environmental standards than the EU. We will be a le world leader in uh, environmental standards. Um, and then a, a quote below from the new chair of this Office for Environmental Protection. One of the most important organizations of our time uh, making sure environmental law works, develops as it should to try, truly protect and improve our environment. And importantly, the last bit of that quote, and holding government and public account, public authorities to account without fear or favor. So, so we've, we're, we're on the cusp of, of a transition potentially here, um, but we need to hold them to account and see if this is gonna be implemented. Next slide, please. So if we think, is, is UK policy world leading? Is it gonna be world leading? First of all, we had the environment bill going through parliament where they voted down air quality standards from 2005. The government voted down the air quality standards from 2005 to be met by 2030. Not to be met this year, but to be met by 2030. So they voted that down. So when we have tougher standards in the autumn, what is gonna happen? How well resourced is the, is the Office of Environment Protection going to be and how independent will it be? Is it going to hold government to account or will it just be a lapdog? Look at what's happened to the Environment Agency over the last decade, okay? The last year, the chair of the Environment Agency complained to the Environment Secretary that over a decade, their budget had more than halved, more than halved. And that's a time when we've got, we've had huge problems with flooding in Britain, we've got increasing problems with climate justice, and we've still got significant people living in air quality areas that are above the legal limit, and yet the budget has been halved in that time. Okay, so there is a, there is a mismatch here between what they're saying and what they've been doing so far, because they've been in power this entire decade. No other party, one power. Next slide, please. Okay, so that is to set for you the big picture. Um, I hope you found it useful. What I think is going to happen is I think that the EU and the USA will start to move ahead of the UK. Um, I will be very surprised if out of the UK, the USA and the EU, the UK ends up with the best air quality standards and the best enforcement. They said they want to be world beaten. They said they want to be world leading. Let's see what they do. If you're interested in this work, uh, I've given some links here, and in particular on a practical side, you can have a look at the toolkit. Uh, next slide, please. So feel free to connect with me. Um, you've got all my stuff there. I'm very active on Twitter and I've got an air quality list. Uh, thanks to Joe and Julian in particular for organizing this session. Back to Joe. I think we're going back to Joe. This Joe, maybe, um, Joanna Lane, um, are you still there? Not quite at the moment. Um, John, that was a, a really interesting talk, and I definitely feel your passion about inequality and certainly inequities and inequality. It, it tends to affect air quality and people living uh, with a poor air quality um, worse than a lot of uh, other environmental factors. So it's great to have that passion, and we do hope that. Um, we can become the leaders that we say we want to be. Um, I'm not sure I haven't clocked any questions in the, in the chat just because uh, I've been monitoring other stuff. Julian, any any questions come through that anyone's seen? 
Uh, not anything yet, but lots of people introducing themselves and their work, which is really good to see. Um, hi everyone, I am back. I'm afraid my laptop just switched off and now it's come back to life. Um, I think we're probably probably at the right time to move on to the second presentation, if that's okay, Joe and Julian. Um, so just to say that um, Joe and Julian are going to give an update on the Joint Air Quality Inequalities Project, um, which has brought together a really amazing network of experts. Uh, some of those experts are by experience. They've got first-hand experience of air quality and the social and environmental justice issues that air pollution intersects with. Um, and others have a wealth of experience in research policy and, and practice. Uh, so we're just going to hear a summary of some of the lived experience that's been shared so far by that project. Can I hand over to you, Joe and Julian? Brilliant, thanks, Joe. Um, can everyone hear me? Excellent. So my name is Joe Swift. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the Joint Air Quality and Inequalities Project that we've been uh, running here at the Environment Agency. This is a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, Julian, next slide, please. So first a bit about the project and some of the context behind it. We know that air pollution can lead to both short and long-term health issues. We also know that air pollution can impact on some groups more than others. We know that the inequalities gap is widening and that these inequalities have been made worse by the pandemic. This prompted us to look again at health inequalities. We acknowledge that there's been lots of good work in this area and in general, national air quality is getting better, but the inequalities gap is widening and this is the challenge. Next slide, please, Julian. These are just some of the policies and plans that aim to address inequities and inequalities, both explicitly and implicitly. They present us with a mandate for this work and they provide both a challenge and an opportunity. They are all about better outcomes for all. Uh, it's not about impeding development, but facilitating sustainable development and growth for all, whilst also reducing inequalities. We can make the bigger gains in areas of inequalities and these gains will benefit us all. Next slide, please, Julian. We want to understand a bit more about what's happening. The project is built around a collaborative knowledge share, engaging and gathering the experiences of those living with air quality and health inequalities, and engaging those with the expertise in the area uh, and those from the academic side and also NGOs. It's primarily a collaborative listening exercise to gather the lived experience of those most affected by air quality inequalities. And we want to build on the work that's already done We've tried hard not to duplicate any of the work, but the unique selling point to this project is about the lived experience and putting people at the center of the project. Next slide, please. This slide breaks down the stages of the projects and looks at some of the roles and responsibilities. The whole project is a collaborative effort and it's designed to work for everyone involved. It's mainly based around a series of 12 focus groups, eight primarily around the lived experience, for marrying up that lived experience with policy making and academic experience. Next slide, please. So these are the eight sessions of the lived experience. We've tried to make sure that cross-cutting themes such as gender are accounted for in each sessions. So we looked at age, ethnicity, housing, lived environment, employment, travel, geography. Next slide, please. Also equity and community engagement. We're now presently in the consultation validation period before bringing in the existing knowledge and expertise and policymakers to consider multiple deprivation, those with a responsibility for inequalities and ideas for interventions. Next slide, please. So these are some of the project outcomes and outputs. We want to gather the lived experience, understand the relationship between air quality and inequalities and how these impact people. We want to look at practical ways to change behaviors and decrease in individual emissions and exposure. We want to understand the barriers that exist and how we can address those. We want to start to inform policy interventions and pilot schemes. And we want to help people with the best practice for communicating with the public. Next slide, please. We also want to form a, an extended network with people interested in tackling air quality inequalities and provide resource for future support and cross-sector working. The resources for everyone to use in their work and we want to provide that impetus for work around inequalities. 
some of the actual outputs are an internal uh, published report, an externally published report suitable for sharing with interested parties, and resource packs containing key findings, considerations, quotes, barriers, etc., that we hope everyone can use. Next slide, please, Julian. So this is just a very brief update. The project is a collaborative effort, and we have a network of over 170 individuals and over 70 groups involved. We've had eight sessions so far, with 110 individuals attending, averaging about 35 per session. And we shared the slides. We've also produced an interim summary report and an interim findings report, uh, which we're happy to share. And we've set up the Air Quality Inequalities Network and had a number of successful collaborations. So please do register with us for the network. This will allow you access to the resources and to link with other members. But we're keen to say there's no obligation for anyone involved. Um, we, see, we see this as a collaborative effort. Uh, next slide, please. Just shows some of the uh, the 70 different groups and organizations that have been involved. So we've, we've had a, a very good response to it and we'd like to thank everyone who's been involved. And I think that's where I'll hand over to Julian. Thanks, Joan. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Watkins. I work at the Environment Agency. I'm just gonna run briefly through um, some of the interim findings. Um, a lot of these will be sort of expanded on and elaborated on in the um, panel discussions that we've got over the next little while. So I will uh, just run through some stuff quite quickly. Um, so across the eight sessions, we ran a series of breakout rooms that allowed participants to delve more into the subject matter of presentations, central topic of the session, and their own experiences. Um, the above uh, sort of the, the bubbles represent the uh, dominant points of discussion across all of the groups and across all of the sessions, with, of course, lived experience at the, at the center of, of everything. Um, some of these are ideas for solutions, um, some are identified barriers, and some are both. Um, so for example, uh, data was quite often raised as a, as a positive. We have lots of it, and it can help people to make uh, decisions. Um, it was also raised as a barrier in some areas. We maybe have uh, too much, a lot of noise, and it's not necessarily in a format or communicated in a way that people um, understand or do something actionable with. So, um, on the next couple of slides, I'm just going to run through a few of the key talking points as well. So, um, central to everything, of course, is the importance of uh, listening to and engaging with those who truly understand the issue at hand. So, those with lived experience. Um, without that breadth of experience, uh, we risk being blinkered in our approach to interventions and solutions. Um, we need more and better consultation and engagement, and this needs to be accessible and equitable, and it needs to platform the, the widest range of people possible. Um, as I touched on before, um, data, research and findings need to be useful, um, they need to be available to everyone and uh, people, whether it's individuals or organisations, need to know what to do with that information and what it means and, and sort of targeted things that they can do. Um, a lot is made of individual behaviour change as being a solution to a lot of things, you know, whether that's for air quality or something like climate change. Um, and obviously there is a lot that we can do as individuals in our in our day-to-day -day lives, but for a lot of people, they are limited in the choices they can make and are not necessarily in a position to make the changes that other people can, whether that's due to employment, housing, or uh, sort of threats of other issues. Um, so to that end, particularly with air quality, um, responsibility can't just lie with individuals and um, it needs a cross-sectional approach with input and action from everywhere, whether that's employers, planners, government, and the full range of people and groups. Um, to that end as well, um, uh, targeted action to a particular focus and those most impacted are going to be preferable to universal action, incorporating that lived experience in um, creating and driving those, those interventions forward. Um, so what's next for the project? Um, as Joe touched on, we're planning to run a few more sessions with a bit more of a policy focus, um, engaging policymakers and focusing on ideas for possible interventions. Uh, we're launching sort of an online Slack space for, um, to allow for the sharing of resources and connections to be made between members of the network. Um, uh, so do, do get in touch with us if you're interested in, in finding out more. And also, um, as Joe said, this is a, a collaborative effort and we want you know, we've seen positive engagement and working relationships being formed between partner organisations, and I hope that's lead to sort of action and change into the future. Um, yeah, as Joe says, it is uh, a collaborative effort, and um, 
something that we feel is fun, worked well for everyone involved. Um, so we'd like to thank everyone who has been involved over the first eight sessions, everyone who's here today, um, whether you've attended some of our earlier sessions or not, and um, to everyone who uh, is going to sort of contribute more in the future. So if you would like to get involved more, please do contact us. I'll pass back to Joanna. Thanks very much, Julian. Um, I have been having some technical difficulties, but I seem to have a good connection now. Um, I think we're probably going to move straight on to the panel discussion, if that's OK. Um, so if we could stop. So our, our panelists, I'm going to welcome to the uh, floor, as it were. And I think if we stop sharing the slides, then perhaps we can see their faces. Um, the first question I want to raise, and I, I really would welcome questions from attendees. So. Um, please do use the Q&A function uh, that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the first question that I want to ask, really just drawing on our presentations this morning, is why should the air quality debate be framed around equity? And why is it so important that we do that now? And um, I'm gonna go to bed, Ben Hudson, please, from Global Action Plan first. Uh, I just wanna say thanks, Ben. Global Action Plan leads on Clean Air Day and have done a huge amount of work to bring us all together. Um, ben, why should we be talking about equity? Uh, thanks, Joe. that was a nice introduction. Of course, it's not just GAP doing these things, there's thousands of organizations around the country doing stuff. We have to report them too. Um, so air pollution isn't just an environmental issue, um, it's also a health issue and a social justice issue. Um, air pollution disproportionately harms people in more deprived communities and communities of colour, um, and people living in the most deprived communities contribute least to this problem. So they're also more affected by some of the solutions, but I guess we'll get into that as we go forward. Absolutely. Um, and now I'm going to go to Noel, if that's OK. Noel Nelson from the Met Office leads on the Clean Air Programme um, and a massive research programme looking at how we can w work together collaboratively um, to tackle some of these issues in the future. Noel, why should we be talking about equity in the work that we do? Thanks for that. Um... Uh, yeah, there's several things I could say here, actually. I think um, uh, from our point of view as scientists, we, we often get sort of um, um, bogged down, if you like, in the science and the nitty gritty of the science. But uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, this is not just a scientific uh, problem. Um, it is a societal problem uh, which has many um, uh, inputs uh, from things like behavior, economy, et cetera. Uh, but right at the heart of it, I think, is behavior. And I, I do also think that um, because there are many uh, communities that are disproportionately affected, that the, the focus should be on them, that you know, within the policy arena, where we're very used to speaking about those most vulnerable, whether they be the very young or the very old, for example, or people with existing um, um, health conditions. However, there are others who are disproportionately affected. And I think up until recently have gone unnoticed. Um, and I believe that uh, that Although the science is important, it's only one of many inputs um, mm -hmm. to providing a proper holistic solution. Thanks. 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 Um, and now we're going to go to Dr. Joe Barnes. Joe, what's your perspective on this? Thanks, Joe. Um, I think this is such an important issue. We've had exceedances of air quality objectives and limit values for so many years. We are well beyond the deadlines when we are supposed to have achieved these. And as people have said, it is the poorest in society that are most exposed to air pollution and they have the least agency to change their own situation. But they're not necessarily the ones that are causing the problem or will probably come on to that as part of the panel discussion. Um, but yeah, I mean, they are the ones that have the least ability to change and we really need to be listening to the lived experiences of people in order to be able to understand how policies can be implemented to help to enable them to live um, lives that are not not blighted by air quality or air pollution mm -hmm. i should say absolutely thanks joe 
Um, and now I'm going to go to Araceli uh, Camargo from the Centric Lab. I know in some of your recent work, you've talked a lot about activism. Why do you think that equity and activism are so important in this debate? Well, speaking about equity or equitability is simply more accurate because of all the stats that everybody has, has already mentioned. Um, and two, equity and equitability frame the conversation in other important words, such as fairness, justice, and dignity, um, specifically dignity, which is a word that we seldom have in these conversations. So one thing is with that it dignity adds that extra layer. So it's not about, for example, providing someone with efficient transport, it's the quality of that transport. Um, and in terms of communities and activism, they are important because they are the reason we have the changes that we have and the justice that we have. So anything in terms of rights, any, any little bits of changes, which are small, but at least we're having them, are to do with community. So the first community that gave us the vocabulary of environmental racism and environmental justice was an African-American community in the 1980s in, um, in North Carolina. And the leading professor, or um, as he calls himself, the godfather of environmental justice movement um, is also an African-American professor who was one of the first people to do a data and arguably a geospatial analysis of where African-American people were living and where landfill sites were also being located. So it's, it's accuracy, it's within our history, and it is the way that we achieve change. Thank you, Araceli, absolutely. Um, and finally, last but not least, I'm gonna go to Dr. Laura um, Fogg-Rogers. I know that you've also done lots of work with communities. I'm sure you'd agree with some of the points that Araceli's just raised. They're the ones leading the way and we're listening. Um, why do you think that equity is so important at this time? Well, I think really this is a political problem. It's not a scientific problem. We've got the facts. We know what causes it. We know what we need to do. So it's about the willingness to make those changes. So it comes down to whose voices are being listened to. And that's what we've looked at in our research. I mean, there are clear disparities between who pollutes and who gets polluted. Um, and there's disparities on age, gender, income, ethnicity. So it's about who gets the right to pollute. Um, and you know that comes down to yeah, which, which voices are being listened to. Um, therefore, it's a political problem. Mm. Absolutely, thanks, Laura. Okay, the second question um, that I'd like to pose to the panel, um, please feel free to put your hand up if you particularly want to comment on a question that you've seen in the chat or from me, um, otherwise I'll, I'll kind of go around to you all. Um, so there are some um, misconceptions around equity and air quality, or do, do you think there are misconceptions around equity and air quality? Um, and that's particularly in relation to interventions and solutions. So we are seeing local authorities taking action because they have been forced to do so. Um, and there's lots and lots of communities organizing around these issues, but what are some of the misconceptions and perhaps some of the kind of uh, lines of conflict, shall we say, that are laid down. Um, ben, I'm going to come back to you if that's okay. I know Global Action Plan works a lot with communities and also um, with local authorities. Well, yeah. So I think the biggest misconception is to assume that all interventions and solutions are equitable and that everybody can access and benefit from them equally because they're not. Um, so when we look at things like um, the ultra low emission zone extension, um, we look at clean air zones, a kind of wealthy response to this might be to buy a second car, a newer car or an electric car. Now that isn't an equitable solution for everyone. Uh, we've seen uh, people um, exodusing cities, right, moving away from polluted regions. Again, not everyone can afford to do that. So there's definitely ways in which um, kind of how this plays out among people. We see um, uh, some of the kind of problems as well. So I'm going to pick on um, kind of wood burning as a huge issue um, caused by a very small percentage of the population. Um, again, it goes back to who's causing the pollution and who can respond to it um, accordingly. So I think lots of the solutions at the moment lying in things like technology, uh, 
pollution filters. Again, not everyone has access to these things. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to come to you, Noel. Uh, first of all, have you got any comments on this in terms of in terms of interventions and solutions? And one of the questions that's come up in the chat box is around perhaps the difference between universal and targeted interventions. Have you got any comments on that? Um, yeah, not a great deal actually. I, uh, one of the other misconceptions actually that I want to just bring up is that. Uh, um, that it's just the city areas that are polluted. I'm afraid that's not the case. Um, there, there's a, a, a reasonable uh, um, high concentrations of certain pollutants that will happen in rural environments as well. Uh, with regards to interventions, the way that the government have, uh, have always um, approached this is by first finding out where the worst polluted areas are, which are the uh, um, industries and or the main sources, if you like, of emissions, and then targeting their um, their policy to help those um, uh, polluting industries and or other sources reduce the amount of emissions that are going to the atmosphere. Um, however, um, and, and they've had quite a bit of success in the past in reducing uh, poor air quality, but I think their policies have sort of leveled out quite a bit. And I think um, it, it's become more apparent that we need to do more than just um, uh, uh, highlight those areas that the science has highlighted. And I think there are other issues with regards to behavior, for example, etc., and uh, making it easier for people to do the right thing that have come mm -hmm. to the fore. Absolutely, yeah. So that kind of historic approach to stop the pollution at the source has obviously improved air quality loads, but not for everyone. It's been really unequal. Um, okay, I'm going to come to Araceli now. Have you got any comments about those misconceptions? Um, yeah, so the first is um, under the expertise in data, and there's two pathways in that. The first is that people use data and expertise as a scapegoat for, um, or I should say, as a tool for inactivity. So as Laura said, this is no longer a scientific problem, it's a political problem. We don't need any more evidence, we don't need any more data. Arguably, we don't even need any more monitoring. We have over 100 years, 100, the first study of epidemiology looking at air pollution to health was in the 1800s. So we're past that. And unfortunately, then the second pathway is that that is being used to gaslight communities and asking them to prove that they are being affected by air pollution. And this is what's happening in South Hall. And for four years, they've been pointing to the exact site and cause to their poor health outcomes. But unfortunately, organizations like Public Health England and unfortunately as well, Environmental Agency have asked for more evidence that those two things are linked. And we have to, and this is where the second pathway comes in, is that we have to trust citizens that they have expertise about what is happening to their bodies, which they do time and time again. Really now as a scientist, what I'm discovering is how well people understand um, in a very scientific way their experience. But the cloaking of expertise and data erases those voices and erases those, those expertise. And we have to stop that because the longer we wait for that, for that data that we technically don't need, the more in real life people are suffering. So the more we hide under academia and science, the more real people in real circumstances suffer real um, poor health outcomes. And that's unethical. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for bringing it back to uh, that story about a specific community. I think we can get a bit lost in this being theoretical. It's not theoretical. It's very real. Um, and I'm going to ask Joe now if you want to come back on this question. There's actually a comment in the chat. Um, just to say that actually, perhaps the reason that we are um, so focused on gathering more evidence uh, is because resources are limited and so we're, we're trying to prioritize or weight interventions. I know you've done a lot of work Joe, on uh, local air quality management um, and understanding what's happening at a local level. What do you think is going wrong? 
That's a good question, Jo. Um, I think in many cases, it's a lack of political will. There's always a trade-off, of course, with any um, the priorities that any local authority has. Um, but I think sometimes air quality can get lost in that mix of things. And I think giving it the appropriate weight is, is really important. And one of the things that, one of the, the misconceptions, which I really wanted to bring up, which I think is plays into this, is around um, the implementation of things like clean air zones and low traffic neighborhoods and the perception that actually those kinds of measures that are targeting traffic are disproportionately affecting the poorest in society. Where actually our own research is showing that the poorest in society that A, are gonna benefit more from those measures because they're already exposed more to air pollution, but also they are less likely to even own a vehicle in the first place. So those measures are not going to necessarily be affecting them. They are less likely to own multiple cars. Um, they are less likely to own a diesel vehicle, interestingly enough, and they are driving less overall anyway. And so the measures that are tackling or, or, or attempting to tackle um, road transport are not going to be affecting those poorest in society simply because they just don't have the, the vehicle. They're not they're not doing the driving. So, um, yeah, I think that that's a really crucial issue. And I think if more politicians recognise that, that might shift the weight of policy. Absolutely. Thanks, Joe. So perhaps we're moving towards talking about a different type of evidence that actually looks at some of those perceptions and, and challenges them. Um, Laura, I'm going to come to you now. Have you got any further comments to add around these misconceptions about interventions and solutions? Sorry, my Zoom froze at that moment. I think I'm back though. So, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I have. Um, on the the story that we hear a lot, I think, in the news is um, yeah, ma male drivers, car drivers uh, versus male cyclists. Um, so it's kind of you know the war on motorists and cyclists and so on. Cyclists taking over. And actually, um, and I think that's again about which voices are we listening to, what's considered normal, which comes down to Noel's points about behaviour and who, you know, how we're communicating about this. Actually, um, if we think about it, the, the interventions that could help reduce, well, enable active travel and also reduce air pollution actually benefit women and children and the more vulnerable in society. Um, so women tend to drive less, men drive much more, um, and women tend to use public transport more and walk more. So we're not taking into account other non-normal um, transport users and kind of what would um, help them. And similarly, as Joe says, for, for um, the, the different communities as well, it's framed as kind of, you know, the, the poor communities want to carry on just going about doing their work. Actually, the research shows that, I mean, and, and that will definitely be the case for some people, um, but not all. And that's the media framing of it, is it, it puts it that way. And it's not telling the whole story of this is very complicated and we're not used to hearing all those voices, which is why, um, yeah, that thinking about the different stories and voices is really important in this and how we communicate those voices and raise them up so that we can listen to them. Thanks, Laura. Um, does anyone want to come back on anything that's been said so far? Otherwise, I will move on to one of the questions in the Q&A box. No, no one's jumping in. OK, so um, I think people have already mentioned some of the barriers. Um, but a question has come into the Q&A box from Simon Burkett. Thank you, Simon, about how do we um, how do we bring issues around air quality and um, justice to uh, places like the COP26? So that's the International Climate Conference that's taking place in Glasgow uh, this November. And the negotiators there will be talking about um, climate change. Um, but 80% of the sources of local air pollution and greenhouse ga gases are the same. For example, combus combustion. Air pollution people are not mentioning climate change and vice versa. I suppose, would the panel agree with that perception? How do we bridge that gap? I certainly think that lots of the same issues around social justice, health justice apply across both. So would anyone like to uh, start us off on that? Yeah, no, thanks. I can say a couple of things in that um, I believe this is something that has, has I think, been a, a problem within the scientific community because 
there is a tendency to compartmentalize things. Um, although uh, the, the government's own uh, air quality expert group um, um, produced a report quite a few years ago looking at the synergies between air quality and climate and recommended that uh, there should be joint policy development in this area. It still hasn't happened. and. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what's stopping it, because perhaps everybody that I speak to in government level seem to agree that it's a good idea. Um, I think that the one area that does help us combine the, 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 the two areas are those of health impacts and understanding the chemistry of what's going on in the atmosphere that naturally draws both the climate and the uh, air quality issues closer together as far as the research is concerned and also if one looks at the problems of air quality now and how it's impacting on health it only then becomes uh, i think a quite a natural thing to think well what will happen in future years when climate change really gets going how will that affect just day-to-day -day air quality and the impacts on our health besides all the other uh, problems associated with higher temperatures and et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm not quite sure what's holding us back because as I say, practically everybody I speak to um, agrees with this. And I know many, there are many individuals who are, are producing very good reports and papers um, showing um, examples of how to bring these two areas together. So- well, um, perhaps. Uh, perhaps Perhaps, Noel, you could share some of those links on the sure. Slack or even in the chat box. I know at 11 o'clock we are going to hear from some different voices who are certainly doing this work on the ground. Aracelli, did you want to come in on this? Um, yeah, so we at Centric, we're, we're, we're starting to migrate from the vocabulary of speaking of climate change and looking more at um, biodiversity degradation, because that's technically the umbrella term, and that's really the crux of the problem, right, that air pollution causes biodiversity degradation, so it pollutes also our water, our soil, our land, which then can't do their job on the other end, um, so we're destroying our trees. So it's not just us that's affected by air pollution, all our biodiversity is, and so our trees are not working as effectively as they should. Um, and in turn, that causes more air pollution, but equally the changes in temperature. So when we have a heat wave, um, it traps air pollution um, on ground level and it can, and, and the combination of heat end up being very detrimental to, to health. Um, it's a risk for um, stroke, but it's also um, asthma and other cardiovascular diseases. So um, we're migrating towards that. And also we're migrating towards a more inclusive framework of talking about nature as healthcare. So again, we are talking about a macro solution basis rather than do we drive a car? Do we not drive a car? It's how do we live in mutualistic symbiosis with nature? And that is more of a systemic approach. Um, I'll put the link to our to our um, to our equitable equitable mobility report as well as Nature as Healthcare report, which both look at this phenomena at a systemic level, joining climate change and air pollution and health all under one umbrella. Thank you. That's a really comprehensive answer, and I certainly would encourage people to read those reports. Laura, did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, on Noel's point and, and Aricello's as well, that um, it, it's all connected, as we know, we actually found that quite useful um, for communicating to people. So we were talking about our behaviour, so people, you know, connecting it to real life experience and health impacts and what, we're to, as Noel said, the health impacts are useful to talk about because we're talking about short term health impacts and long term health impacts from the same sources. So we may have air pollution in our communities today, but those same sources that, you know, cars or home heating and so on are then polluting the atmosphere for the longer term as well. And people, they did, they understood that well. Kids, it works well for, for children, education as well. You know, you can then really imagine these gases coming out and kind of what they're doing to, to us and to the planet as well. So um, I think when it comes down to thinking on, a, on an individual level about um, how we pollute, but also how we're affected, um, it's useful. And it's probably in the policy circles that it's not connected because it's just, you know, different departments not talking to each other. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's a few more questions in the Q&A about um, 
I think indoor air pollution and, and a few other things, which I think really will be covered by some of the speakers in the second hour. So we do have another hour, 11 till 12. Um, so I'm not going to answer those questions right now, I'm afraid. Um, but I really just want to go back to everyone in the panel. Um, we've talked a bit about the conflict between people. We've talked a bit about the evidence and what kind of maybe a different type of evidence that we need. Um, but I just want to ask a broad question. So what do you think is the biggest barrier to positive change over the next three to five years? Um, I'm going to come to Ben first. I would have to say the economy and the kind of COVID bounce back. Um, so the a pandemic definitely accelerated certain trends, um, home deliveries being one of them, potentially bad for pollution. At the moment, they can be better if they're delivered um, in a consolidated way and by kind of electric or low polluting vehicles. Um, the pandemic also accelerated a kind of trend from work from home, which, you know, arguably good and bad. So less commuting, less travel emissions, um, maybe kind of, yeah, London is suffering a bit and large metropolitan areas. Maybe that's giving a boost to small towns and cities, so maybe good. Um, there's also been a huge surge in the secondhand car market, right? Um, as there's a kind of um, hesitancy to get back on public transport and that surge in kind of second cars, people driving. So I think we're going to see, yeah, and pollution, pollution has kind of exceeded pre-pandemic levels as well. I think that report came out this week on that. Um, so I, I see these as, as as kind of the biggest barriers <clears throat> at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, recent reporting on 2020 air pollution levels showed that there's been a massive spike in ammonia air pollution in Wales, mostly from industrial agricultural sites. All of our protected natural sites are um, suffering um, from that. So certainly we need to think about um, some worrying uh, data in terms of air pollution at the moment. Joe, I'm going to come to you next. What do you think about the next three to five years? Feel free to be positive. We want to hear about barriers, but obviously there's loads of great work going on. So we want to hear about that too. I wasn't really set up to be positive there, was I? <laughs> but thanks, Joe. Um, what I was going to say um, was I think one of the biggest challenges, not really in the next three to five years, but obviously we need to be making changes sooner is obviously achieving net zero um, but linked to that obviously is having to deal with the phase out of um, petrol and diesel vehicles the phasing out the sale of them by 2030 i don't think people i don't think business i don't think as a society we're really on track to do that uh, so i think that's going to be a major challenge um, i was just looking at um electric vehicles and, and the charging networks around that and it's just impossible to rely on electric vehicle charging networks at the moment so massive challenge if, if we are going to phase out petrol and diesel vehicles and we become reliant on electric vehicles it was a massive challenge to actually get face up to that too so yeah I think the biggest challenge is around transport for me. Great thanks Joe. but what an opportunity to transform our transport system right? Turn it around. Um, yes of course. <laughs> okay Noel I'm going to come to you next what about the barriers? Hi, oh, yes. Um, I agree with everything that's been said so far, actually. Um, I did want to add one other thing, though, that in the past we were very keen to disentangle economic growth from CO2 um, emissions, for example. I wish we could do something similar as far as some of the air quality um, pollutants are concerned. I also think that, um, that although um, the, the, the pandemic and with everybody staying very local has been both good and bad uh, for air quality in some respects um, and in some areas uh, people supporting oh we may have just momentarily lost Noel I think that's not just me. Yeah, sorry, Noel. Okay. Um, More local run businesses as with regard to removing the need, agree with yeah, not using the cars, etc. that are basic for my existence. I need to use my car. What else can I do? And I, I think um, this is something that I think needs to be addressed at local level. And there are various initiatives um, happening um, at the moment to try and do this, to, to, to make sure that um, 
people had uh, uh, access to everything essential to their existence quite close to where they live. Mm -hmm. I think we need to see more initiatives like that. But I, I, I do think that's at the crux of it, is to encourage people to do the right thing. Sure. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to go to Laura next and then finish up with Aricelli. Laura, we've heard a lot about transport. Obviously, that's a massive part of the problem and the solution. Um, what do you think are the biggest barriers then in the next few years? Um, I think for us, it's appealing to the people who are in power at the moment and their voters. It's a very defined demographic of uh, voters who vote for um, our current political uh, climate. So therefore, I think we need to reframe our narrative to appeal to their values and what works. So in other words, transforming the transport system, actually a massive opportunity. You know, think of all the, and it's not necessarily great, but all the new cars, the jobs that can be sold, transforming the electric charging and so on. So this is jobs, skills, economy, and so on, if we if we get that narrative right. And as someone's asked in the, in the chat box as well, thinking through, you know, we have to do a massive transformation here. How can we embed within that to make sure that we're not, um, re-embedding a lot of these um you know the uh, in, environmental injustices in there so changing our narrative to fit with what works but ensuring that um that we also think about that it's benefiting all as well absolutely Thank thanks you. um well i think that um the Das Gupta report that's recently come out looking at the economics of biodiversity really starts to define what a, a transformation looks like. We can't just go back. This year, above all else, has shown us that we, ha we have to move forward. So, Aracelli, we're going to come to you and then we're going to quickly finish off. What are the big barriers and opportunities in the next few years? Okay, so I'll go um, three to one, um, three barriers um, to think about. I think the first barrier is framing the problem at an individual level. It's not about individual behavioral change, it's systemic. Um, so for example, the electric vehicle thing, I was walking around yesterday and I saw a Maserati linked up to a electric vehicle charging in a huge house. That doesn't solve the problem. The Maserati being an electric vehicle does not solve the problem um, because the pollution of a car like that on, on the tire on the road, plus the fact that that person is in a huge house, which is also an air pollution problem, by the way. Um, the bigger the house, the more exhaustive it is for, for nature and resources. So um, that's not where we're gonna find the solution. And I think if we continue framing it in that way, we're never gonna get there. The next barrier is capitalism. Capitalism, especially post COVID, as it's going to ask for more economic generation, more job generation, it's going to want to go hyper capitalistic, which means, as Boris Johnson already said, build, 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 which means that policy then is going to slack. It's going to want to permit more um, of the things that cause air pollution, and it's going to be harder for us to implement structural policies to help on the air pollution and climate change. So we do have to be prepared for a huge backlash due, or with the pretext of the Trojan horse being COVID job generation. Um, but the thing that we do have to always be joyful and positive is that communities are still doing the work. The communities that have been doing the work from day one are still doing it today. So I would really encourage that if you guys want to fill yourselves up with hope, um, go to different um, groups that are talking about climate change and about clean air and clean water. Um, indigenous communities all over the world are doing some amazing um, webinars that are only accessible now because of the era that we're living. But also, you know, look at your local campaigns. We are also citizens. Let's not forget that we also are citizens. We can also join the campaigns ourselves. And sure. good news. Thank you. I'm going to have to stop you there. But what a great segue into the next uh, session. So uh, we are going to finish in one minute, but please don't go anywhere or please take a short comfort break, refill your glass of water. Um, I'm going to hand over at one o'clock to Olivia Sweeney, who's part of the Black and Green Ambassadors Network um, for the second web webinar for today, which is going to focus right back on those lived experiences. We're going to talk with NGO and people involved in community action who have lived experience 
and we're going to explore some success stories, interventions and innovative projects. Uh, so all that remains for me to say is a massive thank you to our panel. Um, I'd really encourage all the attendees to look these people up, look up their work and a massive thank you to our speakers. Um, Olivia, I'm going to hand over to you now. Hi, thank you, Joanna, um, and thank you to all our speakers in the first half um, of this webinar. I was furiously writing down notes of all the things that I'm going to take into the work I do, so I've learned a lot already today. Um, thank you very much. So, hello, everyone, and um, welcome to the second part of the Air Quality Inequality and Equity webinar for Clean Air Day. Um, happy Clean Air Day to you all. I hope you are enjoying it so far and are not going to be sat at your screens all day but will take the time to get out there and get some fresh air. Uh, as Joanna said, I'm Olivia, one of three black and green ambassadors for Bristol. This is a project that aims to lead, connect and celebrate diverse community action as well as creating opportunities and challenging perceptions within the traditional environmental sector. Um, my area of focus and interest is community solutions for clean air and I'm just at the beginning of a project exploring clean air as an issue of environmental justice, talking predominantly to black women um, around their lived experience, perception, power um, and agency for solutions. But as much as I'd love to talk to you all about that today, um, I'm not here in that capacity. I'm here to chair the session. Um, if you've been with us since 10 a.m., thank you for staying on and listening to more. For those who um, have just joined us, welcome. I'm going to briefly set the scene and cover some of the housekeeping. I know Joanna's already touched on this, but I just want to make sure any new new joiners are aware of what's going on. Um, so the Environment Agency and partners have brought together a group of experts, um, some with first hand experience and other with others with different focus areas um, to explore all the intersections that we've discussed already around air pollution. And as a result of this, they've created this network that looks at research and policy and community um, community focused solutions. So having just heard from our previous group of panelists about the challenges we face in this second webinar, we're going to flip the focus and look at outcomes, actions and solutions. So I'm delighted to be joined by five panelists who will share what they have learned and achieved. Just an FYI, this session is being recorded, so be aware of that. We're in webinar mode, so if you have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A function um, because we'll be having about a half an hour chat um, at the end after each, each panellist has presented their thoughts. Um, please do use the chat function to introduce yourself and comment. Um, I would encourage our speakers to do that as well um, so people can learn more about your work and resources and campaigns. Um, and in case you miss anything, uh, we will be emailing you all with the slides and um, a recording of this presentation. So as I said, we are going to start this session with some lightning presentations from each of our panelists. So by lightning, I mean really quick, three minutes each. Um, and then we'll open up to a panel discussion where I'll be asking the questions you put in the Q&A to our speakers today. So I'm going to introduce our first panelist without any more um, faffing from me. So this is Judy Ling Wong of the Black Environment Network, who is both an artist and an environmental activist. Judy. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be with you all. I will start with a very brief overview and then pick out key points from the slide. The experience of living with COVID-19 has opened our eyes to the general poorer health of disadvantaged ethnic minorities in the UK. Just focusing on the theme of air quality, ethnic minorities tend to live in more polluted areas where there are less green spaces and amenities with poorer housing conditions leading to worse indoor air quality. Often they take up jobs that expose them to air pollution, for example, working in the London underground or shift work with unsocial hours. They are overrepresented in poorly paid jobs in the care sector as carers and as cleaners. This is combined with a vital element that injures the immune system, stress and fear, 
from the abuse on the basis of race, faith, and culture, to being seen as lesser, struggling against the inequality of opportunity when someone good enough is never promoted. Many ethnic minorities do not have the equality of opportunity to make life choices. Our futures are determined by the enormous pressure of how others see us. Having given some limited insight into the state of affairs, let's now move quickly on to key actions to repair the damage. Black Lives Matter has given a tremendous impetus to diversity, equality and inclusion, and this is a moment that we should all make the most of. Under representation, the most important point is to put high-profile diversity champions into place in organizations. High-profile champions demonstrating commitment to diversity and equality at the top is vital. They can drive policy and change, release resources, keep tabs on progress, and get things done. Under engagement, the most important element is to support the co-creation of solutions. The key principle is to pay attention to the fact that affected communities should lead. We need to build ongoing relationships, not on and off relationships, with ethnic community groups local to us so that there's genuine trust that we can work together and co-create relevant local solutions within equal partnerships. And finally, under provision, people do have agency. The most important point is to give information to improve health through personal action for self-care using a range of communication avenues, including websites, community newsletters, and word of mouth. There's also a rising generation of multicultural activists and voices that needs a greater platform. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Judy, for being so perfectly on time and covering so succinctly and eloquently some really important points. I think that humanity that you bring in um, is really vital and that idea that these communities that are the suffering the most are are tired from a lot of other stuff and we've got to consider that in the actions that we take forward so thank you um, i'll now pass over to kate langford um, who is part of impact on urban health thank you so much olivia and thank you judy that um was a a, a brilliant and really moving summary of i think some of the challenges that we've heard from communities in Lambeth and Southwark Bay. So I'm Kate from Impact on Urban Health. We're an independent foundation uh, focusing on two London boroughs, Lambeth and Southwark, uh, to tackle health inequalities and ha health inequities. Um, so we're in the first year of a 10 year programme uh, looking at how we can equitably address the health effects of air pollution for residents in our boroughs. Um, and we're funding everything from working with construction and freight industry to find solutions to reducing emissions, to working with our local hospitals, to working with schools. So a really wide range of projects, which you can read more about on our website. Today, I really want to highlight though some work that we're doing, which actually comes to Judy's main point around how can you co-create solutions with communities? Um, I don't believe you can have equitable solutions unless you involve the people who are most impacted by the problem in actually defining the problem and coming up with those solutions, setting up parameters around what does equity mean to them? What does this problem look and feel like to them? So I've been really lucky that I get, got to work with a brilliant group of community researchers um, over the last six months um, who are paid members of the community who have been going out and talking to their neighbours, their friends, their networks to try and understand how does air pollution resonate as an issue? What change do they want to see? What change do they feel able to make? And how do the current, I guess, networks or narrative resonate with them or not? And sometimes it is that it doesn't. Um, so I put a link to this report in here, but I think I would just really want to stress actually the power of a community research approach. Quite often the way that we can do research with, especially underrepresented communities, 
you send in outsiders to do to ask people questions they disappear nothing changes how can you make sure that research is an extractive process how can you make sure that people are able to actually see solutions contribute to them and follow through so i'd really be happy to discuss a bit more about that in the panel but also please do look at this report and some of the work on our website um, which outlines it in more detail Thank you, Kate. That's perfect. And again, thank you for sticking to a very short three minutes. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying about people of the community talking to people as opposed to outsiders coming in. That's a lot about what I do. And the language that comes into that is also really important. So asking people what they need to breathe is what I'm going with. And you instinctively know the answer to that question as opposed to asking, how does air quality affect your day to day life where everyone goes, what, what are you on about? That makes no sense. So. Um, I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. Um, next up, we have Hilda Palmer, who is from the Trade Union of Clean Air Network and also the Greater Manchester Hazard Centre. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you very much. I'm just going to apply quickly on, but thanks for great previous speakers. Air pollution is a public health emergency, but it's been an occupational health emergency for decades or centuries. At least 30,000 deaths per year in the UK, and millions of workers are made ill every year. Workers are the canaries, exposed first, exposed most, and considered last, if at all. All workers are exposed to air pollution at work, with the lowest paid at most risks and multiply exposed to toxic substances in air at work, at home, commuting, and their families most affected. Add in race and sex, and it becomes even more toxic. Air pollution, climate change, plastic, other pollution effects on workers and public are all linked. So we set up the trade union campaign for clean air, centered on the need for collective integrated action to cut toxic substances at source of work, to protect workers' lives and health, get toxics out of our work, our homes, our environment, our bodies and our lives, and to create decent jobs and the just transition to a cleaner, greener, fairer world. All solutions have got to be fair and increase equality of health. Next slide, please. There's a the crisis of failure of health and safety laws to protect workers has been exposed by COVID. The HSA and local authority budgets of enforcement have been cut by over 50% and political interference since 2010. Workers and safety rights need increasing with much stronger enforcement. There are laws and COSH is one of the most important. The control of substances hazardous to health regulations puts the duty on employers to assess the risk to workers' health from substances, chemicals, dust, microbes, that they're exposed to at work. And that includes external traffic and other air pollution because that also becomes indoor pollution. If it's assessed as harmful, then the control hierarchy is to eliminate the substance Substitute something safer, not one bisphenol or chlor chlorinated solvent for another, but different types of chemicals or do the job differently. If you can't do that, then collective engineering controls and PPE only as a last resort. The HSE don't enforce this control hierarchy well, so there's no pressure on employers, suppliers and chemical industry to clean up their act. Safety reps have rights and powers under the safety reps and safety committees regulations, but they're also not well enforced, but even so. Safety reps do use their rights to be informed, consulted, given relevant information, data sheets, health hazards, and to represent workers, carry out inspections and investigations and so on. They use tools like body mapping and hazards mapping to find out what's harming workers and where. And they demand monitoring of chemicals and inhalable or inspirable dust where it's useful. But the HSC work exposure limits are very poor. They're set too high for health and there are too few of them. There's no level for diesel fumes. Toucan has work, been working with Global Action Plan, carrying out monitoring of uh, nitrogen dioxide and PM 2.5s in various workplaces to support specific action. Safety reps ensure all the relevant information is fed into the COSH assessment, all areas of work, all exposures, all workers included, drivers, outdoor cleaning and ground workers, and that different effects due to sex, age, reproductive issues, et cetera, are considered and gender stereotypes challenged. With a more stringent precautionary preventative participatory approach, strengthening of COSH, strict enforcement, this can have a major impact on reducing toxic substances at work, improving workers' health, and contribute massively to reducing air pollution, climate change, and all pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilda, for covering so much in such a short amount of time. I think it's really important, as we discussed in the previous panel, I feel like we get hung up a little bit on traffic and cars. That's not to say it's not important, but if you don't think beyond that, you miss the workplace that is so vital and it speaks to the privilege of a lot of people who are in these conversations that they don't think of workplaces as being toxic. And, and it helps us think of, of air pollution as a global issue because 
you know, traditionally polluting industries might not be in the UK anymore, but that doesn't mean they're not elsewhere in the world. So it helps us have a, a global look at the problem as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, next, I'm going to pass over to Stuart Phelps, who's a fellow Bristolian like me um, and is uh, part of Residents Against Dirty Energy, which is a group of people who fight the air pollution effects of dirty energy. So Stuart, over to you. You're on mute, Stuart. So do you want to start again? Got you. Good morning. You can hear me now. Apologies for that. Um, can I have the next slide up, please? What you're looking at now is a map of the eastern area of Bristol and the red slash that runs across the top left hand slide of your screen is part of the M25. The red slash that runs down along the left hand side of the map is a piece of road called Eastern Way, 1970s dual carriageway and lined by five council estates, six tower blocks, and just in the six tower blocks, there are something like 650 families. That red is red because it is at or above the level of nitrogen dioxide legal limit. The top left hand side of the screen, which is nice and green, and some of you can probably see it is actually called Green Bank, and that's not a joke, it's actually the name of the area. That's where nitrogen dioxide levels are very low. And the reason that that map is in front of you is because if you're not careful, you displace nitrogen dioxide from Green Bank onto Eastern Way. And what you're effectively doing is you're taking it from privilege to deprivation. Can I have the next map up, please? This is the map of deprivation from 2011. And as you can see, the red is red from the previous map. The green is green from the previous map. In other words, this is demonstrating very clearly the link between nitrogen dioxide and deprivation. And it's very hard to step away from that. What does this mean in practice and in the work we've been doing in the area? Well, I'm going to put some numbers in which are quite unusual because most of the time when we're talking about surveys and work in this field, we very, very rarely have demographic information on who took part. We do on one particular study that looked at transport issues in Eastern and 90% of the people that were involved were white. But in the ward where that red area is on this map, only 40% are white. No black people took part in that study, yet 37% of the people in the area on this map are black. What does this really mean? It means that the people that are setting the agenda are nothing like the people who are potentially the victims of displacement from the nice green area at Green Bank to the red area on Eastern Way. It's very difficult. We've heard just now from Hilda about the impact on workers. I've actually been in two conversations on air quality where I've heard one white van drivers described as collateral damage. And on another occasion, you can't talk to, to taxi drivers because they will play the race card. The net effect of all of this is that the people who are most affected have been excluded. How often have you seen a report on air quality issues? And it refers to the fact that there are hard to reach groups after an agenda has already been set. Those hard to reach groups have views. If you get it right, and we don't always get it right, but we try hard, you can build up from trust, but it takes a long time. You have to start looking at, and I was interested in the work in Lambeth and Southwark about paying people to take part, because most of us in this meeting today are either paid or they're people like me or are semi-retired and can afford to pay for themselves. The vast majority of the population cannot afford to take part unless we pay them. We've got to look at various different issues. And I'm going to end on a little anecdote. It comes from our origins when we were fighting diesel a diesel generation plant next to a nursery school. And we thought we were going to lose. 
and I had the embarrassing experience of standing in Lidl and a young Somali girl ran over to me with a bunch of flowers and said, my dad says you're heroes because mum's in hospital with asthma. And if we don't fight that, it'll get worse. Years later, when that site was redeveloped for a clean energy solution, what fought off the diesel generators and so on, that young woman contacted me and said, you do realize the work you did means one of the reasons why I'm now going to be an engineer. And that is what we've got to achieve. And I'll end there. Thank you very much, Stuart, again, for bringing that humanity in, but, but showing, showing the problem so clearly. And this is exactly where, where I live as well. So I know, I know what you're talking about um, and I completely understand and agree with what you're saying. So thank you for that. Um, finally, uh, we're running perfectly to time, so I will pass over to Dr. Susan Bartington of the University of Birmingham, who is a clinical research fellow and consultant on public health. Thank you so much, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'll go straight on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So at the University of Birmingham, we have a whole range of, of clean air science research spanning all the way through from basic science to working with policymakers, engaging with the wider general public, as well as um, informing clean air solutions. And that's really what I wanted to focus on here in this short talk. So the setting of Birmingham is overall a reflects I think a, a relatively deprived population certainly we know that there it's it's one of the most um, deprived areas in the UK and in fact it has some wards which are among the, the very most areas of deprivation and around a quarter of children in Birmingham live in low-income families this is also reflected in the health of the Birmingham population. So life expectancy is below the national average, and that is a really significant gap. So if we look at some of the most recent data, it's almost nine years lower for men and, and almost seven years for women between the most deprived and the least deprived areas of the city, which is a really stark gradient when we're thinking about inequity. And that difference goes throughout the whole life course. So all the way from increased risk of infant mortality um, at the start of life, low birth weight, through to child health and adult chronic disease. So particularly high rates of cardiovascular disease, lung cancer and respiratory disease, of course, within the, within the city. But it does have a young population as well. So when we're thinking about the talking about impacts and looking at the future as well. Birmingham does have a particularly young population and also it's an area where actions are being taken to, to tackle these issues of poor air quality. I'll go on to the next slide, please. So most likely you will have heard about the Birmingham Clean Air Zone, which was introduced on, on the 1st of June initially with, with charging introduced earlier this week. And um, of course, this is a targeted intervention as we've already heard from, from Stuart as well. There are of course challenges with those targeted interventions, but it is very much focused upon achieving compliance with legislative limits for nitrogen dioxide. Now, if we think about the impact of nitrogen dioxide, and this is something which our, our health and um, economics researchers are, are looking at at the University of Birmingham and actively investigating, we know already that there's around 1,000 early deaths per year attributable to poor air quality in the city. And when we actually look at that for nitrogen dioxide, it's around 170 to 180 early deaths at a cost of about 75 million. Now that is a likely to be a very much an underestimate because it doesn't take into account those wider societal costs. Um, and as I said already, those quality of life impacts from poor air quality. We also know that in the city there's around 3,000 cases of asthma each year and the risk of developing asthma is around 38% higher 
among those living inside that clean air zone area in the center of the city compared to those living in the wider city. And similarly, there's an increased risk of around a third for, for lung cancer as well. So as I said, the, the clean air zone was introduced on well, from the 1st of June initially with, with charging more recently, following on from the introduction in Bath back in March, being the, the second clean air zone outside London. And of course, um, monitoring will be in place. And also at the University of Birmingham, we've been undertaking modelling as well around specific scenarios. So we're not trying to actually predict the impact of the clean air zone because we are aware that there are many unknowns at the moment and that is how people will respond to this, how they would change their behaviour, how they would change their driving patterns, um, changes in terms of the vehicles that they own. There are a lot of unknowns and I think what is really important is to learn from this and transfer that knowledge to other areas which of course are, have schemes under different stages of development at the moment. What we do know is at the moment around a quarter of journeys within the clean air zone are made by non-compliant vehicles. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of those will switch and certainly very unlikely to do so uh, immediately. And of course, there are a set of exemptions in place as well. But we do know that if all non-compliant vehicles did um, become compliant, then overall nitrogen dioxide emissions would fall. And that's roughly by around um, a quarter for nitrogen oxides. But as I said, there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of unknowns about how people will change their behaviour and how this will affect the wider area, how it will sit in terms of the context of broader air quality schemes. And we've already heard about the importance, for example, of actions to tackle particulate emissions, of um, a broader strategy that considers industry, agriculture, um, we heard about domestic energy and wood burning as well. And also that awareness, what impact does the clean air zone have upon public awareness of poor air quality and the need for change. So I will um, pop into the, the chat, one of our blog pieces, which is out today by Professor William Bloss, uh, myself and Professor John Bryson at the university, exploring some of these issues as we move forwards, um, just a couple of weeks into the clean air zone. And also, of course, I'm very happy to pick up in, in the question session as well about these key learning points as well. But I think what is really important is that we think of air quality as a health issue and that we put public health front and center of our dialogue about air quality. Thank you. all of our panelists for talking about your area of expertise summing up what i'm sure is, is a lot of work and a lot of knowledge in a very short space of time i know can be difficult um, i would encourage people to keep putting questions in the chat that you have thought of um, but i'll now welcome all our panelists back onto the screen so we can have a discussion between all of us um, there was a couple of questions that have already been posted. Some have been answered straight away in the chat, which is great. I'll just read those out in case you've missed them. Um, so one of the questions was, how are we reaching out to people um, to gain their engagement? Uh, this was a question asked by Noel. Do they even know about the ways they can get involved to provide their feedback and experiences? Um, Stuart answered this one succinctly. He spoke to the power of WhatsApp groups if people haven't got the time to be present. Um, because of their personal circumstances, um, you know, social media and WhatsApp groups are a great solution so you can get their votes and thoughts in. Um, and then another question that was posted that I don't believe has been answered yet. Um, oh no, I've missed, I've misread that. So I'll leave that one there. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a question um, to the panellists. I might not ask everyone um, from the panel for a response. We can get through as many questions as we can, but if you particularly um, feel like you've got something important to add, please do wave at me or interrupt so you can be sure to get your, your opinion um, and your thoughts um, involved. So first up, I'm going to go with a question that is, do we have too much of a focus upon vehicles and technology and too little of a focus upon people's behaviour and choices when we're thinking about air quality um, and the policies that surround it? So I'm actually going to go to um, Kate first, if that's okay for that question. I guess um, for me, there's kind of two parts to that question. So the first point on do we have too much focus on vehicles? I think from all of the panelists say, I would definitely agree that 
it's it's obviously a key source of air pollution that we can tackle, but there are others and we have we can't be blinded just by focusing too much on vehicle emissions. So in our work, we're looking a lot at construction because there's a huge amount of regeneration in Lambeth and South Africa, uh, particularly in areas where you historically have poorer communities living, a lot of those areas are being regenerated. How do we make sure that that construction doesn't negatively impact their health? It's actually a really substantial contribution towards particulate matter. And as Hilda mentioned, we know that construction workers are living on some of the lowest income. So if we're thinking about equity, we can't just ignore certain sources of air pollution. And I think the other one that, um, you know, we've been talking about is wood burning, just the contribution that a very small number of people make to a very large proportion of particulate matter. Um, and I, I've been uh, kind of reading through some of the research on that recently. And actually in London, we found that most of the wood burners, they're not doing it because they don't have any, any other way to heat their homes. It's uh, what we talk about as aesthetic burning. It's, it's, for, it's for the way that it looks and the kind of warm, fuzzy feeling that it gives you. But like, is that good enough if it's both harming your health and harming your neighbor's health? So too much focus on vehicles. I think the second one is a really interesting one. Uh, should we be focusing more on people's behaviours and choices? I think this. I think there's a really fine balance here because I think we need to understand what behaviours and choices people can change. Like what what are real choices and what aren't? Because you know we're really in danger of lecturing people who aren't contributing to the problem and who don't have agency to make changes and in their lives that just it's just not fair to ask them to and you know a kind of classic example that we often talk about is can you tell people to walk down more less polluted roads and some of the research we've done people have said well like, I'm worried about walking on back streets because I'm a woman and I don't feel safe at night or like I'm worried about like the other teenagers from my school like some of these choices aren't actually choices as we might think they are so I think really understanding people and what is a choice for them before you kind of start lecturing or kind of advising people um, and understanding the kind of context and wider context they're living in. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I totally agree with all of that. Um, I know that Stuart wood burning um, is an area of focus for you and particularly that idea of it being aesthetic burning as opposed to necessary burning. So I suppose I'd open it up to you to add a comment on that. But again, the question being, more broadly, is there too much of a focus on, on vehicles and, and technology? I think we have over-focused on nitrogen dioxide. And as a consequence, we have, we are losing a battle of whack-a-mole because if you just take Bristol, it's estimated 300 people die prematurely every year from uh, air pollution. 168 of those are attributed to PM 2.5, and only 11% of PM 2.5 is reckoned to come from traffic. Uh, if uh, there'd been time, I would have stuck a third map up, and it would have been the alternative to the two that I sat, because the red area would have been Green Bank, and the green area would have been Eastern Way. That would have been for PM 2.5. We've been monitoring it for five years, and the reality is that the air pollutant problem in the most affluent parts of inner Bristol are down to the very people who probably complain most about the traffic who own the wood burning soaps. There's a simple solution we advocate, paint it pretty colours, stick an aspidistra in it, it's still in keeping with the Victorian property and you won't be polluting your neighbours or yourself. Not popular, but I'm afraid I don't know many people living in council housing who burn wood. Uh, or uh, in private rented. And those are the people who are the most vulnerable and are dying most often. And I think we've got to come back to that. Yeah, I agree. I think the severity of the situation uh, means that we can't always have fully fully popular choices. It has to be about, about the good that it does and not necessarily the popularity. I see that both Judy and Hilda have their hands up. Um, can I go to Hilda first? Would you like to add? Just very quickly, I agree with everything Kate and, and Stuart has said. I think there is a bit too much focus on traffic and the issue about choice and behaviour. People who go to work have very little choice about what they do. Um, and we have to stop actually quite often punishing them, really, in the way we're talking mm -hmm. about this. The behaviours we need to change are the behaviours of their employers and the behaviours of the enforcers and the behaviours of the law and policy makers. And I think that the whole wood burning issue is a really is a really key one. 
Um, I think when you have 7% of the, of the population creating 40% of the PM 2.5s, and I agree with Stuart that, you know, these are the really serious ones and we should focus on that as much or more than, than nitrogen dioxide. That's a really clear equity issue that we have to really deal with. And most people are just using it, as Stuart says, for, for higgy, you know, for coziness. I love a fire. I love a wood fire. And it hurts me deeply, but we have to stop our obsession with this. Allow people who really do need to burn wood in very rural, more isolated areas, farmers using their own wood and whatever, allow them. But there's absolutely no reason for posh folk in Islington in London to be keeping themselves warm with a wood stove when they've got gas central heating. Thanks. For answering all my further questions, so that's brilliant as well that you're ahead of the game. Um, and Judy, um, your hand up as well, would you like to add? Yes, I want to come back to the point that a lot of the things that are put forward as actions and so on are very much in the middle class context. You know, they ask for things like drive less cars. Well, we don't have any cars. We can't afford them. We can't even afford bicycles. Bicycles are expensive and you need local workshops where you can maintain your bicycles and be confident on them. And we need routes that are really safe locally not just on main roads because my goodness you know some of the cycle routes i see they're, they're right in the middle of the traffic where the pollution is the worst and you're breathing hard how can that be good for you so all these things are about people's lives and one of the things that i think that that i said is the principle is that affected communities need to set the agenda with their own lives locally of course we need national policy but ultimately the ultimate expression is local success by the way you implement things. So supporting the rise of local voices is really important. Sometimes you're lucky enough to a small minority group that is very vocal. You might have a brilliant one single activist that speaks well and so on. But you need to empower people to come together. And one of the major things for people who are vulnerable and so on is the ability to campaign to really join with large mainstream organizations taking up the course and campaigning together for those changes that will lead to real changes, not only abstractly national, but real, really locally. Perfect. Thank you very much, Judy, for those thoughts and additions. I, I agree with everything you're saying, and it's, it's, it's about your your points are so are so accurate this idea that solutions are quite middle class and it also makes people when you start to link air pollution to climate change and other things like that if the solutions that are presented are middle class people start to believe that the problems are middle class thing and actually you can't be involved in it so it's dangerous from both perspectives um not only that people can't engage but then then people can start to stop caring because it just doesn't feel relevant so it's it's dangerous for a lot of levels um i'm gonna move on to another question if that's okay um, with all our panelists and this is going to go to Suzanne first um, and we've touched on this a little bit with the uh, looking at PM levels versus um, NOx levels as measurements but my next question is from a from a public health perspective should we have a more prominent focus on PM may that be 2.5 or otherwise um, exposure rather than NOx Yes, absolutely. I know we've already touched on this um, with the with the earlier question and Stuart's response, but I mean, absolutely. And I think what what is going to be increasingly important is the prominence of PM as we move forwards, and of course as we go through the Environment Bill, etc., and changing legislative landscape as well. I totally agree. There has been, you know, a, a focus upon NO2, and I think that that is a result of legislation that indeed has had unintended consequences as well as, as a result of the way in which it, it has evolved and been implemented. So I think it's really important that um, certainly in the, you know, in the health community and in the policy stakeholder community, we're, we're ahead of the game with PM, we avoid some of the, we need to identify and avoid those mistakes that have been made with with NO2 and I think also we're going to have to think much more strategically in terms of integrated actions so a key element here is when we think about that that dynamic between local government and national government who has control I, I saw a discussion point there about the fact that we have this focus on traffic simply because it feel it's something that can be controlled and it's obviously uh, that the local government upper tier is the highways authority um, when we get to talking about 
agriculture, um, industrial emissions, domestic heating, for example, we're talking about a far more complex set of stakeholders involved through public and private sectors as well. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a real challenge when you begin to think about actually implementing these actions, it has to be integrated and it has to avoid unintended consequences because we've seen those historically in the past. Yeah, yeah, no, brilliant. I think we're, we're, all of us are talking to a holistic approach for everything as much as possible. And, and as the previous panel spoke to as well, um, this has come from a science place, air pollution, at least, at least to go uh, up until this point. And uh, I mean, I'm an engineer and you have a habit of, of siloing things and that hasn't got us very far or in a very good direction so far. So we need to turn around um, sharpish if we're going to make the change we need to. Um, I've got a couple of specific questions in the chat. One is aimed at Stuart first, if that's OK, but I feel like um, I might also get uh, maybe Judy and Hilda to come in on this one, too. Um, how do we minimise environmental or ecological gentrification risks? Uh, do we need alternatives to potentially regressive metrics such as property values? Um, and do you have any examples, best practice examples on this? Uh, right. Yeah, we do have a problem. Uh, one of the biggest problems is what we're calling dictatorship of the iPad, which is during COVID-19 and especially the conversation has shifted online. And most of the people that are taking part today, even with our connection problems, have got office quality IT in front of them. Uh, most of my neighbours are not and simply can't get into the conversation at this point. Somehow we have to give greater weight to them. Somehow we have to recognise, picking up on the public health thing, that maybe we've got to start approaching this from where are people dying fastest and youngest. And if that was Bristol, that would be Avonmouth, not the city centre, because of all the industry, motorways, docks, the rest. Gentrification is a problem. Um, it's not going to stop. It's not going to shop, stop in the short term. It's probably not going to stop in the long term. But we have to say to people, your voice is part of setting the agenda. And my problem at the moment is the agenda has been set. And then we come along and say to people, whether you're the workers in the factory or the people living on Eastern Way, uh, you haven't contributed. We want you to contribute in these terms. And that doesn't work. Examples of good practice. Um, probably the motivation we had to get involved in PM 2.5, which was a group of Asian women coming to us and saying, we've got a problem with our neighbours who are moving in, putting in wood burning stoves and not listening to us when we say our um, mothers, daughters, aunts, their health was destroyed by cooking over wood fires. We know the problem. And they're looking down on us because we live off of taxis. How do we actually approach that? And what we came up with was something called the Bristol Pledge, which was to recognise PM 2.5 is way down the government's agenda because it's not illegal in terms of limits, because of the wrong set of limits, something Joe Barnes has referenced earlier. So we asked people to start voluntarily stop burning wood stop eating wood cooked in a wood stove. Um, if you want a really bad example of PM 2.5, live in a flat over a pizzeria cooking with wood because you have to breathe it in six nights a week, 52 weeks of the year, and you're probably on a very low income and unable to move. It hasn't been as successful as we would like, but it has shifted things. And our biggest success with that and the monitors would be persuading a shop, and I will name them, Bristol Sweet Mart, who on seeing the data from PM 2.5 monitors screwed to the outside of their building, stopped selling wood. They simply said, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to take out a very profitable line because we don't think this is ethically viable. A brilliant example of, of success there. Um, and it's nice. Uh, as Joanna was talking about in the previous, it's nice to have that positive to, to realise that, that things can be better. Judy, you've got your hand up. Would you like to add to that? 
Yes, when I think of the problem of gentr gentrification, you know, like Stuart said, it's not going to stop. But when I hear that, what I want us to think of is where the poorer disadvantaged groups end up and what we're going to do about them. And I think that one of the things I want to point out that's very important about the issue of, of um, air pollution is that at the moment it's got the label environmental. Once upon a time, you look in the dictionary, environment meant everything. But the environmental movement ran away with that word so that when you think about it, it sort of had boxes of what environmental issues are. Air pollution is much more than that. It involves every sector you can name. And what I want to happen is that the issue of air pollution is taken up by all these non-environmental organizations. You know, people who are about children's well-being, people about health, people about where your school is built, planners and so on. All these organizations need to come on board and people who live locally need to have more access to power by linking into all kinds of organizations that have a stake in their health, in their education, in their ability to have power, better jobs, whatever they are, unions and so on. They need to come on board in such a way that local people feel very vulnerable, very much abandoned, suddenly find that yes, perhaps we can have access to power because there's a whole spectrum of organizations that will link into air pollution and what's happening to people. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you, Judy. Um, and I think that links well with the theme of Clean Air Day is protecting children's lives. So we're starting to see that shift from it being said, um, being framed as one thing to, to multiple things. Um, Suzanne, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, just to pick up on that point there from Judy for the health professional community. So I always say I've never learned anything about air, air pollution at medical school. And when I was training to be a doctor, uh, you learn about other risks to health, uh, lifestyle risks, smoking, alcohol, etc. Uh, other environmental risks, um, particularly occupational exposures, of course. But but air quality, and I think it's really important, the announcement we've, we've heard today from the Royal College of GPs as well, in terms of that, that commitment to um, ensuring that air quality is recognised and, and also, of course, the you know, moving towards an ambition of making sure it's integrated in, within health professional training, I think is absolutely important because the health community needs to take ownership of this issue because it is ultimately a, a health problem and a health challenge and we need to tackle it in that way. Definitely. And I've just seen a, a comment from Rosamund um agreeing that it needs to be um an issue of public health and for those who don't know rosamond she's been a, a a pretty strong force in changing people's opinions and and making this an issue that everyone is aware of and fighting for you also posted a question that i will uh pass to kate first if that's okay sorry we haven't heard from you in a minute um so what do the panelists think the narrative think of the narrative that if you live by a busy road you're kind of fair game and, and you're, it's not you're not a priority to people yeah i mean i'm i would be very sad if that was a narrative that was taken seriously by anyone from a public health background or from uh a kind of interested in inequalities and air pollution and tackling the link between them because um uh, when we have a situation where I'm a bit concerned about there's more and more awareness of air pollution in certain communities. House prices have become more and more linked to air pollution. You can now look up the air pollution around the address. There's talk of in building that into, you know, websites where you where you're looking at house houses. I think there's a there's a real chance that that could increase inequalities if it becomes more and more something that you can buy your way into. Um, I don't think we should think that any community is fair game, any community is too hard to ensure that they have clean air. I do think the solutions are different. So some of the solutions, some main road traffic and main road sources are something that we need, especially in London, a lot of the local authorities can't do anything about it. It needs TfL to step up. It needs more action from the Mayor of London. And some of it will be addressed by ULA's expansion, but I don't think that goes far enough. So. Uh, main road communities are not a fair game <laughs> they they are definitely not and i don't think anyone from a kind of interest in public health and in health inequalities would ever um think that they are so um yeah i am worried that in 10 years time we'll still see a problem with air pollution on main roads and we won't see it in other communities so we do need to address it 
Perfect. I think um, it's really important you highlighting this idea that you can buy in and out of yes this is comes back to the point that we made earlier yes data is valuable and yes monitoring is has its place but when it starts to be commoditized by that we we start going down a very slippery slope that um i would argue has you know no no good point no good end point um but who knows um hilda your hand is up would you like to add to that one yes i i just say that um people have always bought clean air <laughs> the richer have always been able to buy clean air. That's why the why why busy roads are a problem. The people who've bought the clean air out in the countryside are driving along those busy roads in their bloody great four by fours, polluting the poor people who are actually living there. And obviously, it's not right. It's not they're not fair game. And this is why, as we've heard all along, this is a highly political um, issue. And it's something that you know the health of everybody and the health of those communities must be put at the heart of it. And we've got to find mechanisms for improving and protecting those people's health in the in the short term while we're actually addressing some of these issues in the long term. It's really, really important. And in this country, we have a real problem with our environmental pollution uh, laws and enforcement. And we have the authorities, made partly due to um, problems with things falling between different authorities and also uh, deregulation under, under funding of those authorities. We've got massive gaslighting going on where people are being exposed to horrendous levels of pollution from traffic and from wood burning stoves and all the, all the rest of it. And people basically saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it. And it's, it's not okay. And so making all of this much more visible, trying to give, make sure those people's voices are heard and encouraging them into it, it, you know, has to be the way forward. And we have to expose, you know, what are the real problems? What's going on at the moment is an absolute bloody crime against the health of mm -hmm. poorer people. And it's absolutely sodden outrageous. Exactly. I think um, my point was it's becoming more explicitly commoditized. That doesn't yes, mean it yes, 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 um, yes. I was reading about the history of the east and the west side of, of cities and, and the Victorian industrial and how the wind, the industrial and how the wind blows and, mm. and these things that are embedded in that people don't like to think of by design, but it, but it is the case and it's, it's building up to all the things we've been discussing. Judy and Stuart, you both have your hand up, hand, hand up, hands up. Um, uh, if I go to Judy first, can it just be really brief because we're coming to the end and I want to get one more question in. I think the legal profession has to play a real role in this. As you know, in the environmental sector, the issue of environmental law having have absolutely no teeth. The fines are so low that, that environmental industries or, or what they think is just a business cost, you know, and it's pushing people using the law towards creating the law that is coming that is eco side. And you're going to be really slammed by this. You're going to go to prison for it. I think that we need something similar to pin down something by law to stop children actually dying. I mean, they are dying. It's not a, as if they just got a little bit of poor health and so on. This is really serious. How can people be dying? And by law, nothing happens to anybody. I think this has got to change on the legal front. Yeah, the legal side is really important. and. To speak to Rosamond's story, not to not to use your um, take your put words in your mouth, but um, that that has begun to change with what Rosamond has done. Um, but it needs to do a lot more. And I'm very excited to be talking at a, 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 a event this evening that looks at when environmental harm becomes a legal issue, and it doesn't just become damage. You know, when harm becomes a crime. So I feel like. The tides are turning but it's not happening quickly enough and with enough force for it to actually have the impact it needs. Stuart, your addition. Very quickly. Firstly, uh, we have adopted not just within our organisation but within the planning groups across East Bristol that we are part of the principle this morning that we deal with the worst first and we do everything we possibly can yes. to tackle the worst yes. pollutant first in the worst area and we make sure that nothing makes that worse and that brings us into direct conflict unfortunately with things like low traffic neighborhoods where and i quote it is true that some through traffic may be displaced to other nearby roads but the volumes of displaced traffic may be small relative to the volumes of traffic on the main roads i'm sorry that's completely and totally unacceptable because what that actually says is you put it from the privileged area 
to the unprivileged area. The people in the red band on the maps I show will get more traffic, more PM 2.5, but they've already got a lot. So what does it yes, matter? Exactly. Sorry, exactly. not all. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yes, that is really important. Sorry, I was reading in the chat. I agree with what you're saying. And I think it's about sometimes when things like this are billed as a livable neighborhood, it sounds appealing and it's all about how things are how things are worded and asking the why and looking at these unintended consequences or intended, however you wanna however you wanna look at it behind things before signing up. So we have come to just about the end. I feel like I'm going to be cheeky and add in one more question because we haven't touched on clean air zones much. Um, and this is at the moment one of the, the main driving forces or a big driving force that people um, governments are using to help tackle air pollution. So I would just like to get one question around that. Um, and this one's specifically for Suzanne, but um, I, if we have time, I will ask one or two other panelists. Um, so has your modelling looked at how much um, it would have detracted from potential improvement in air quality in polluted areas in Birmingham had they adopted the Class C CAS instead of the Class D, both in terms of reaching government deadlines um, and also how quickly compliance can be achieved? Yeah, I think that's a question for the modelling team specifically. <laughs> I mean, Birmingham opted obviously for the Class D CAS based upon the, the legislative timescale for achieving compliance and with objectives that I've already outlined. Obviously, it's very much a compliance driven intervention um, and, and Bath similarly went well went for CAS C. I think that what is really important here is that now we learn from those. So as clean air zones emerge and as we see more of them, which we will do, I think it's really important that we look at the different mechanisms because, of course, there's different exemptions as well around the introduction of, of charging. And I think it's also going to be important to understand the behavioural changes so that we don't get too focused on the, the technical issues around this comes back to the point about vehicles that we get very hung up upon the emissions and technology. But I think what's really important is that we understand how people respond and that we do the right research around introduction of those zones so that we can then apply that knowledge and we need to do that very quickly and in a very responsive way. Thank you Hilda I can see your hand up but we're running to the end of time so um, I'm gonna just quickly ask Kate because um, I haven't come to you as much as I should have apologies for your thoughts on on clean air zones and implementation um, and and how that can and can't have unintended consequences. I think, I th so clean air zones in general are a very effective way to be able to reduce air pollution for, for all who are living in the community. So I'm very pro um, clean air zones. I do think we need to, what I try and do in my work is I have an explicit equity framework. So for every intervention policy project that we're looking at funding, we try and assess what are the no potential knock-on effects on particularly disadvantaged groups. So we try and think of, it, think of it from all of those different angles before we fund something. And then we try and make sure that we're evaluating to try and pick up any unintended consequences as soon as we can. So I think we just need to take that approach, thinking about how would this affect people living on low income? How would this affect carers? How would this affect people who are reliant on cars because of disability? And make sure that that's embedded into the way that we plan our policies. Um, so I think having a having an explicit approach to equity in the way that you design and evaluate your interventions helps to avoid some of those unintended consequences. Perfect. Thank you very much um, to all our panelists. Sorry I couldn't get to all of your questions, um, but I feel like we've covered a lot in our session. Um, I've run over time, so I'm going to keep my summary short. I think we've we've touched on on a lot of things, um, but the the crux of it being that we have to make sure that all voices are heard. In, in whatever solutions we're building and those are driven from the communities that are affected. Um, so they've got a sense of this power and agency that some have um, and others don't. And if we don't, we don't act on those things now. Um, those, bar those barriers and those discrepancies are gonna get worse. And this isn't something that's just about air pollution. It's about so much more, but it's particularly important in the air pollution framing because as we've said, lives are at risk and it shouldn't be something um, that we're, we're thinking about maybe doing in the future when people are, are suffering and dying right now. It's something that we need to do um, sharpish. 
So I will wrap up there and pass back to Joe, who's going to end the session. Brilliant. Thank you. I've been sitting here and really enjoying the sessions. I think it's been some really interesting debate and some really important issues raised. Um, I'd just like to ever echo everyone's thoughts that it is that lived experience. We need to connect with the people who are suffering the most from some of these inequities and some of these inequalities. So I'd just like to say a personal thanks to everyone um, from Julian and I for contributing. Uh, that's to the panel, but also to the participants as well and the attendees. Um, I'd also like to just say about the Equality and Equalities Network, if people are wanting to join it, please do let Julian and myself know the resources from everything that we've been talking about today will be on there, but also all the panellists and a lot of attendees are part of that network, so you will be able to connect with those people uh, through that, uh, that network, and we hope that people will use this as a springboard to start doing more good work and considering uh, air quality inequities and inequalities in everything that we do. Um, but it's a big thank you for me. Happy Clean Air Day to everyone. Please go to Global Action Plan's website uh, to see what else they are doing today. Um, and I think that's probably it from me. Julian, did it, anything else from you at all? Uh, nothing specific. Thank you so much to everyone who's uh, who's joined us today, to all of our panelists and speakers. It's been a really great and engaging session. Um, I'll phone our contact details uh, back up on the screen. Please do get in touch if you want more information, if you're looking to put more, more resources and more findings out over the next little while, and we'll share the links to uh, the recording and everything else um, over the next little while. But yeah, please do. Please do.